So very good evening to one and all. Uh, I'm Dr. Pradyumna, representing the Medical Affairs team of AstraZeneca. On behalf of AstraZeneca, we would like to extend a very warm welcome to all our esteemed faculty and delegates attending the session across the country. Every scientific engagement and session has been a platform for novel practice changing insights. And this has really brought in a transformation to the current standard of care. So today, AstraZeneca, in collaboration with the Chess Council of India, would like to take this opportunity to bring forward to you renowned experts from the field of medical oncology and interventional pulmonology to kindly share their expertise around the topic which we have themed as eminent, which means escalating monitoring and interventions in the IPN management, which thereby leads to optimal management of an incidental pulmonary nodule, which has a malignant potential through enhanced screening, delivering innovative medicines, and thereby translating to better survival and quality of life. So with that short background and without any further delay, let me take today's opportunity to welcome a very renowned speaker from the international platform, Dr. Bobby Mahajan, sir. He's the Medical Director of Interventional Pulmonology and Complex Airway Program at Inova Fairfax Medical Campus. He is also an Associate Professor, University of Virginia, Medical School, Falls Church, Virginia. Dr. Mahajan has a very special interest in the management of malignant complex airway diseases, airway complications following lung transplant, and bronchoscopic lung volume reduction in patients with emphysema. Additionally, he also oversees the Innova Incidental Lung Nodule Program and the Lung Cancer Screening Program. Sir has obtained his fellowship in electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy and several other complex interventional pulmonology techniques. Dr. Mahajan serves as the board of directors for the American Association of Bronchoscopy and Interventional Pulmonology. He has over 50 publications to his credits and has delivered several scientific lectures and research presentations on national and international platform. Sir, it's a privilege and honor to have you with us. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much for the introduction. It, it really is a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak to uh, such esteemed physicians in the international community. And on, honestly, the, the Chest Council of India is really, from what I've read so far and the interaction I've had, it is incredibly uh, powerful in terms of pushing forward some of the ways that we can organize and honestly shift the stage of lung cancer diagnosis from late stage to early stage. Um, so today I'm going to share my screen quickly um, and talk about incidental lung nodules and what their impact is with regards to improving cancer survival and shifting stages. Um, so this is a, uh, a overview of not only what we do in the United States, but also some of the ways of implementation we've been able to do at Inova Fairfax Hospital, where three years ago, we had no way of organizing and or following these nodules. These are my disclosures. Um, none are relevant here as we talk about these incidental lung nodules. So, you know, I'll say we have a very different perception uh, from the community and from physicians in terms of what inner, inner, uh, uh, lung cancer is. On the left, as you see, the incidental lung nodule. This is a lady who was a 42-year-old uh, East Asian female of Chinese descent who came in, was found never having a smoking history and was found to have this lung nodule. Whereas on the right side, you see a small cell cancer invading into the airway um, on, a, on a heavy smoker. The challenge is both of these were found incidentally. And the question is, which one can we identify incidentally and get to a curative state versus what we can do palliatively? And this is the real dichotomy we run into in the not only United States, but around the world is identifying these lung nodules early and also being able to treat them as effectively as possible at an early stage. The challenge we run into the most part is not necessarily finding these patients, but actually getting them through the medical system so they are identified, biopsied, and treated as effectively and timely wise as possible. So not a uh, surprise to anyone in this, uh, on this uh, talk, but really what we look at in the United States, the majority of our lung cancers are adenocarcinomas um, and squamous cell carcinomas. While nodules associated with small cell are, do occur, they're only about four to 6% of the time that they're an isolated lung nodule that's incidentally found. Typically, they're more mediastinal involvement or central airway involvement, uh, resulting in pretty uh, aggressive shortness of breath um, and debilitation. While we see large cell carcinomas um, quite a bit, we also see them as poorly differentiated adenocar uh, large cell carcinomas because of the, the degree of uh, usually necrosis that we identify. So typically what we're looking for, especially from an incidental lung nodule standpoint, we're really focusing on the idea of adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. In the United States, just like in India, we have a number of different opportunities to 
mitigate the causes of cancer. But typically what we see, again, number one, two, and three is always lung smoking histories. Now, the not necessarily the nicotine, but the different carcinogens that are put into those cigarettes are typically what we see. In the United States, um, there is a big push by these tobacco companies not only to provide these cigarettes, but to enhance their, um, their desirability, especially to younger individuals by uh, providing menthol flavors, things of that nature. Radon gas, asbestos are all, are all uh, important causes of lung cancer as well. But really what we're trying to focus on even more so now are air pollution, especially in metropolitan areas and third world countries. And even more so what we're seeing is genetic changes. The genetic influence of these uh, lung cancers developing is an extremely uh, powerful uh, area for us to look at, especially with EGFR mutations in both uh, Asian males and females. Our challenge, what we run into is typically in the lung cancer screening population, uh, anywhere between 50 years old to 77 years old with a significant smoking history, those don't necessarily capture the genetic variabilities that can lead to lung cancers or increase risk of lung cancers. And in fact, about 20% of the patients we see on a regular basis with lung cancer have no smoking history. So trying to identify these outside of the typical lung cancer screening guidelines put together by the NSLT are really challenging. And this is where incidental lung nodules come in. So in the United States, what we look at, you know, we see about 220,000 cases of lung cancer um, per year. And again, it's, a, it's the largest killer of all uh, cancers, even when you combine breast, colon, and pancreatic together. Um, what we try and identify is there an improvement in the success rate and the survival rate of five years. This, is, this data is from 2015, and the reason I show this is that we've significantly improved our five-year survival in the United States to 23% at five years. And the reason for that is early detection through lung cancer screening and incidental lung nodules. And secondly, the ability to actually uh, harness the power of genetic mutations and immunotherapies uh, to try and identify these patients, get adequate tissue to run these tests, and then change the disease process from a, in some cases, a death sentence uh, to something more of a manageable and chronic disease. We've seen incredible improvements with the use of TKIs or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, in addition to PDL1 blockers with regards to the immunotherapy options. Um, and that's where we're really seeing improvements um, in lung cancer survival. Unfortunately, when we look at males and females with regards to success in terms of improvement survival, although there's an improvement in male survival, the female survival is significantly less uh, uh, profound. While there is a significant decrease uh, in, in death uh, related to lung cancer, it's not moving at the same slope and rate as males. Now, in the world, it's a little different than the United States, obviously. Looking at the number of patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer, um, is about 11.6% of all new cases of cancer. And again, about a hundred, uh, about 1,300,000 uh, cases are seen in men and women, uh, respectively, being 725,000. And again, in uh, the, like always, this, the, the risk of smoking is the highest risk factor related to lung cancer. But we are starting to see, as we get this data more um, uh, kind of uh, organized, that 30 40% of lung cancer, lung, um, cancer in Asian patients um, have no history of smoking, whereas in the United States, that's only about 10 to 20 percent. So we're starting to identify that it's not just smoking, it's other genetic factors that are associated with lung cancer, and this means we have to look outside the box of traditional screening. So in India, it's a little bit different as well um, with regards to the world's and the United States. So about 6.9% of all new ca uh, cancer cases and 9.3% of all lung cancer deaths are related in both sexes, males and females. Again, it's the most common cause of cancer-related mortality in men. And it does differ significantly geographically, reflecting both the size and ethnicity of, these, of the areas and smoking patterns. But again, the overall survival is still 15% in developed countries and 5% in developing countries. Again, this is more related to identification of these cancers at earlier stages versus late stages. Again, in the United States, we're seeing the typical identification of a lung cancer. About 85% of patients are diagnosed at uh, stage three and four. And we're seeing that as well uh, in India and throughout the, the Asian continent. So again, looking at the demographics, again, 
a much more uh, robust population in India with regards to uh, the the actual number of, of individuals, but the number of new cases of cancer and cancer-related deaths that are looked at regarding lung cancer um, is still significant. The, the challenge we run into is how do we uh, stop this, not only from identification, but also how do we get these patients in, identified, biopsied, and resected at earlier stages? So, you know, the challenges that I've identified uh, in my reading with regards to um, not only the United States, but also India is in India, there's a pro public and private sector and the, the, the expenditure on health care is 3.6% of its GDP, especially uh, for as large of a population as India has. And uh, really, the coverage uh, with health insurance is low and it's very similar in, in the United States that there's lower in the United States but only about 28.7% of households have any member covered by health insurance in India. And as a result, even if these, uh, I, these nodules are identified, we have to make sure that patients have the capability of getting them biopsied and resected. Um, and economics can be a very challenging part, uh, factor to overcome in order to do so. So early detection right now, there, there's no, uh, from India, we don't see a formal lung cancer screening kind of initiative and cost logistics and the incidence of false positives for lung cancer due to tuberculosis is very high. So the idea of getting a PET scan and looking at a FDG avidity of 2.5 is not really useful, especially when we're looking at a cancer versus a tuberculous lesion. So in the United States and India, we do have a number of approaches to diagnose these lung nodules um, and the mediastinal staging that goes along with that. We have EBIS, which we do on a regular basis. Um, usually um, these are 30 to 40 uh, minute procedures to do a full mediastinal staging and biopsy. In addition, we have a number of navigation platforms for navigating out to lung nodules to confirm where they are, biopsy, and additionally um, to help place markers for uh, for radiation if necessary or for surgery. One of the challenges we do run into as well is the affordability of these uh, these uh, different modalities is challenging. Some of the robotic processes or robotic platforms we use now in our hospital can be ex extremely expensive and make it challenging to get these into a, a, an institution. So in the United States, what do we run into the most? The challenge is identifying these patients early and getting them diagnosed. Unfortunately, about 84 to 85% of patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer in the United States end up being diagnosed when they, um, they the metastasis have occurred to distant areas or um, to regional areas. And as a result, they're typically diagnosed at stage three or four, typically not a surgical candidate at this pace. Now, while we do have genetic therapies and immune therapies that can slow down growth, there's no data that shows there's an actual survival uh, benefit. It does just show a, uh, an improvement in disease-free survival. So again, we're not seeing really the ability to stop the disease or cure this, even hoping to downstage these patients. The stage three and four patients, again, about 15% survival versus an 88% survival at 10 years if we're able to identify these patients early at stage one and surgically resect them or radiate them. What really AstraZeneca is looking for and the lung cancer uh, initiative is to try and uh, develop a stage shift. And when we talk about a stage shift, really what we're talking about is shifting identification from late stage, stage three and four, to stage one or two, early stage, which has the ability to actually be uh, curative. So again, as you look at now, currently, typically we'll see stage one and two in a minority of patients, whereas a stage three and four diagnosis is anywhere between 70 to 85%. Our goal is to reduce that um, that diagnosis at stage three and four using high, um, high tech approaches um, and other techs such as low dose CT screening and for other places that do not have the capability of that yet, utilizing incidental lung nodule util, uh, identification. So if we look at one of the more recent data uh, with regards to lung cancer um, survival in the United States, we, like we've said, we've moved from 17.2% survival to up to 21.7% survival in 2019. And then as of 2021, up to 23%. So we're starting to move in the right direction. The challenge is how do we cure these versus just improving survival? A lot of the survival benefit is really looking uh, based on genetic and immune therapies that are able to suppress disease, but not actually cure it. And again, what we end up knowing is that lung cancer screening is very effective in terms of reducing the mortality with chest x-rays versus uh, as low dose CT scan. The problem we run into is the, the, uh, the cohort that patients are, that are being identified, 50 years old to 77 year old with a new CMS guidelines, but also 
having a significant history of smoking. What we know is that not everyone has a history, a significant history of smoking who gets lung cancer. Additionally, it, it really does overlook a number of Asian populations who, again, have a higher incidence of these EGFR mutations who may be getting lung cancer earlier, even without a smoking history. The last part of this is, it's not easy to run a lung cancer screening program. In the United States as well, we look at the fact that organizing a lung cancer screening program, not only to meet the CMS criteria for, um, for appropriateness, but also following these nodules that are identified and following these patients who are negative, uh, who have a lung rad zero um, identification um, is challenging just because of resources. So what we try and say is, can we look outside of this box of lung cancer screening in high risk patients and look at the capture rate of incidental lung nodules where it can be anywhere from the early 30s to the late 80s and try to identify these patients for lung cancers so that we can treat them early. So I, I want to separate the idea between lung cancer screening and incidental lung nodules, which uh, I, you'd be surprised even in the United States where people say, oh, we didn't know there was a difference. Really, when we look at incidental lung nodules, these are patients coming in typically to our ER who have no history of, um, of lung cancer or known lung cancer, but they're coming in for another reason, chest pain, shoulder pain, um, shortness of breath. They get a CT scan and a lung nodule is discovered. Those are then followed up. The challenge is that about only about 30% of lung nodules that are incidentally found in U.S. Uh, ERs are actually followed appropriately. And unfortunately, about 10 to 15% of those move on to lung cancers and are identified at later stages. Whereas lung cancer screening by the NLST is really looking at a significant cohort of patients between 50 and 77 years old with a significant smoking history of at least 20 pack years um, and or have quit in the last 15 years or active smokers, and show that if we identify that patient population, get a low-dose CT on them, we can improve their survival by about 20% compared to x-rays. So those are the two differences we're trying to focus on. And why are incidental lung nodules important? They're, they're an easy way to start off a process with regards to finding patients because they're already there. Coming through our ERs every day, they're anywhere between um, 10 to... Um, uh, 10,000 uh, to 20,000 people just in our state of Virginia. And those lung nodules are identified and are there. They just need to be triaged appropriately. So the cost of implementing these programs is very low because they already exist. Most of that is just organizing the process. They save lives by identifying these patients. And if done correctly, they can uh, appropriately triage these patients once a nodule is identified to get to the right place. And that's the biggest part. It's not that our patients aren't told they have lung nodules. Most of the time, they're not told the gravity of having a lung nodule and the importance, and they're not referred to an appropriate physician. What we see in the United States is a very abnormal and disjointed care continuum. A patient gets identified as having a lung nodule. They get, get sent to the primary care doctor, then to an oncologist, then to the thoracic surgeon, then to the interventional pulmonologist, then finally to a diagnosis. On average in the United States, that takes about three months from diagnosis of the nodule to actually treatment. What we look with for, for incidental lung nodule programs is not necessarily to find more nodules, but for the nodules we identify to be more organized in our care continuum, see patients in the right places, and honestly speed up our, v our movement of patients. As a result, with our program, we've identified an incidental lung nodule clinic that we created every week, and we see anywhere from five to six incidental lung nodules every week just in our one clinic. So if we a patient is found to have a lung nodule in the ER, they immediately get scheduled in our clinic um, and our seen within the within four to five days and the challenge is that most lung nodules actually are followed are found incidentally the majority of lung cancers do not have um, symptoms until they're more advanced stages and as a result about 62 percent of nodules are detected incidentally either from trauma cardiac symptoms or abdominal symptoms just catching the lower parts of the, the lung out of those 70,000 patients with incidental lung nodules only um, 44 percent were 44 percent of those were never smokers now I will talk about some of our own internal data that's currently under review um, we're seeing that of our incidental lung nodules that we see only about 26 percent of those who are diagnosed with a lung cancer followed fell into the uh, lung cancer screening criteria and this is, again, the power of these incidental lung nodules. Out in the United States, every year, we see about 4.8 million of those CT scans. 1.6 million nodules identified. 
but 1.1 million of those are not actually followed up appropriately. So we're missing anywhere between 43,000 identification of lung cancers. And this is just not acceptable, especially in a situation where we have the technology to do it, uh, but we're not able to follow through with the, the, uh, the actual organization. The main thing is this doesn't require significant high tech um, or expensive programs. It can be done in a very organized fashion just by using people, our biggest resource. And again, what we end up seeing, and I, well, the reason I put this on here is if an incidental lung nodule is identified and it's not mentioned in the report section or told by the physician to the uh, patient in the ER, there's zero follow-up. So part of this is a communication issue, not just an issue of not being able to find these nodules. There are guidelines for how we follow up lung nodules, and there are Fleischner guidelines for incidental lung nodules. Now, that being said, this can be a very busy slide, and it can be challenging to put these together. Utilizing this uh, information in terms of organizing and creating your own um, algorithm and pathway uh, is essential, meaning that you don't have to go directly by this. In our institution, we look at our lung nodules less than six millimeters, six to eight millimeters, and greater than eight millimeters, whether they're a solid lung nodule or a subsolid. And we have a triage direction for each of those, which I'll talk about shortly. Really, our goal, again, is to increase early stage diagnosis. The, the idea of finding late stage disease and treating these palliatively or supp in suppressive therapies, even with our new um, targeted therapies, is really not enough. What we need to be able to do is identify them early, get them staged, diagnosed, and get them to surgical radiation as soon as possible to improve outcomes. This is a Deluge study. It was just recently came out. And this is a great example of looking at a collaborative approach to looking at lung nodules, both incidental and see those seen on lung cancer screening. And really what this shows us is that if we take these two programs, lung cancer screening in addition to incidental lung nodule um, uh, location and identification together, we can see significant improvements in outcomes in early stage disease. And we're able to capture those patients who don't fall into lung cancer screening criteria. And this is the biggest um, frustration and challenge in the Washington, D.C. area. So my institution is just outside of uh, Washington, D.C. We have a very large number of South Asian and East Asian patients who are coming in who don't qualify for lung cancer screening uh, because of their age. But we all know that the incidence of cancers in these patients, even in non-smoking individuals, can occur at an earlier age and with lower smoking histories. So how do we identify them? We do it collaboratively with lung cancer screening for the high-risk populations and then incidental lung nodules for patients who don't fall into those criteria but still have high risk. So Anova Hospital is a, uh, is a uh, large hospital in the um, D.C. suburbs, and we're a five-hospital system. Um, the main hospital where I work um, predominantly is a 1,200-bed hospital um, called Fairfax Hospital. Um, that is uh, in the adult hospital. It's about 900 beds in the children's and uh, adults, 1,200 beds. We have level one trauma, lung cancer, uh, thoracic surgery, uh, lung transplant, heart transplant, and surgical and medicine residency programs. And what we were end up seeing is that a number of these patients were coming through the ER, not having not only identification of these nodules, documentation of these nodules, but appropriate follow-up. And if there's no follow-up, these patients fall through the cracks and end up coming a year later or two years later with advanced stage disease. So we said, how can we try and identify the problem and fix it? And what we looked at was the cause analysis of, are we having the right people here, the right environment, equipment, and process? The funny thing is that we had all the equipment, we had all the environment. The thing we needed the most was navigators, meaning people to actually triage these people appropriately to reduce the number of, uh, um, of identified, uh, poorly identified cancers. And what we did was we were able to take our, our uh, electronic medical record, harness it for a keyword identification so that every time a patient had a uh, CT scan read that said the word lung nodule through the ER, it fell into a bucket based on the keyword identification. And then we had a navigator go through all of those nodules every day and call the patient and let them know that they had a lung nodule. Anything less than six millimeters, we ended up sending to their primary care doctor. Anyone with six millimeters to eight millimeters who was a high risk, 
went to our interventional pulmonary clinic um, or a their own pulmonologist. And anyone greater than eight millimeters, regardless of risk factors, would come to our interventional pulmonary nodule clinic. And what we were able to see is that by hiring that lung navigator, uh, which is a, a person dedicated to this, in addition to some of these EMR software changes, uh, we were able to pay for those, um, those hires uh, within six months. And this is what we looked at. A navigator, not only would this be necessary for incidental lung nodules, but it helped us build our lung cancer screening program. Not, we needed to have, be able to set up a database and we were able to have to set up a communication platform for our patients, all of which was human-based. And finally, hired an, a, a lung no, uh, an innovator for the lung nodule clinic. And what we were able to see is, again, using the, this uh, electronic medical record, we didn't have to spend additional money to identify these. We only had to utilize our own uh, electronic medical record and keyword search. And as a result, we were able to identify these, refer them to appropriate physicians if they were low risk and see them within a week if they were high risk. And this is what we saw in our first 10, uh, nine months, uh, nine to 12 months is that we identified a thousand nodules. We ended up identifying 28 patients who needed procedures and we identified 12 new lung cancers and one uh, metastatic uh, cancer. And you see, these are all the places these were coming from. CT abdomen, CT shoulder, a chest x-ray, CT angiogram for, uh, for cardiac uh, uh, disease, in addition to CT of the thoracic spine. This is our algorithm. Again, if there was less than six millimeters, low risk or high risk, they would go to a primary care doctor. Any of these patients would end up coming to us to the interventional pulmonary clinic, but every size nodule had the opportunity to come to the interventional pulmonary clinic for nodule workup if they wanted to. And this is the demographics we saw. Again, the mean age was 62 years. We saw a relatively equal number of males and females. But again, you saw a very diverse spread of individuals from a race and background standpoint, as opposed to um, just uh, Caucasian individuals. These are the number of incidental lung nodules we did identify. Um, less than six millimeters were the majority, but between six millimeters or greater or nodular opacities was a significant number of patients, about 400. And as a result, we were able to see all of these patients, identify them as having a high lung cancer risk. And if they didn't have a lung cancer risk at that time or not deemed necessary for uh, biopsy, we would then follow them longitudinally to make sure those nodules got smaller or were stable. If they did grow, we ended up biopsying these not only either bronchoscopically or with CT guide needle biopsy or thoracic surgical resection. This is where a number of these patients went based on their nodule size. But the most important thing I want to show you is the early stage disease we identified just through these six new early stage diseases in our first year. Now we're in our fourth year and we've identified every year close to 5,000 nodules that we're working up. Um, advanced stage cancers, five, metastatic nodules, one. So as a result, in just that first year of identifying this process in one hospital, we were able to not only capture the patients we normally capture from lung cancer screening, but additionally, more incidental lung nodules in our patients. And subsequently, it only took one out of uh, 68 patients to identify a lung cancer incidentally, where it was one out of 79 patients um, through lung cancer screening identifying a lung cancer. So what? how do you start an IPN, IPN program? It does not have to be complex and expensive. Really what we can do this is having the resources allowed, we, meaning that engaging our ER physicians, our radiologists, our navigators. These are all people who can say, look, if they identify a lung nodule on a CT scan, the radiologist can involve the clinic or involve the navigator to call the patient and get them in. Organizational referrals and making it expeditious, meaning that if someone comes in with a lung nodule, you don't just say, oh, well, we'll see him in three weeks, get them in right away. Because again, otherwise it's more likely that they're gonna fall off uh, and not follow up. And then finally, provide an alternative to risk factors for lung cancer screening and at-risk populations through incidental lung nodules, like we're seeing here, especially in the South Asian and East Asian populations. So uh, I wanted to thank you again. It's been really, it's an honor to be able to speak today. Um, and, and I really look forward to, you know, further speaking in the future. Thank you, Dr. Majan, sir. It's been a wonderful yeah. session from your end. Uh, <clears throat> let me take the opportunity uh, in the interest of time to welcome Dr. Vijay Kumar Chandam Chetty, sir, the Senior Consultant Pulmonologist, Lead Interventional Pulmonologist at the Apollo City uh, Health City, Hyderabad. He's been a key member in establishing the Department of Interventional Pulmonology at Apollo Hospitals. He would be moderating the session today. He's a ACE academician 
has obtained his fellowship in several complex airway procedures and has presented his research works in various international and national conferences. So has been an invited speaker in various national conferences as well. So I kindly request you to take over the sessions and we, we can engage Dr. Bobby Margins. Dr. Bobby, it was, you know, uh, fantastic listening to you. And uh, I appreciate it. And one of the state of art uh, program that you are running and uh, detection of uh, early lung cancer. Huge appreciations for uh, um, your phenomenal talk and phenomenal work that you are doing. And let me um, have, yes, in the interest of time, I was told sure. by uh, uh, Dr. Murli Daran that you are planning to, you know, live a little early. Uh, yeah, I uh, apologize. My son's birthday no party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So from the entire team of Astra and CCA, okay, we would love, love to, you know, convey our birthday wishes, you know. Um, <laughs> right, you. right. Best wishes to him. God bless him. Right. So may I have, you know, uh, um, some inputs before you leave the webinar. Yeah. So uh, how is artificial intelligence will be helpful in nodule detection programs? So in the artificial intelligence approach is, is obviously revolutionizing how we approach lung nodules, not only from an identification standpoint, but also um, improving our risk stratification uh, based on the different characteristics of the nodule, looking at the idea of speculations, um, uh, growth over time, calcifications. You know, what we're really starting to see is not only looking at these, um, these nodules for identification purposes, which is very important. What we're looking at volumetric changes in terms of following these nodules. So what we're trying to do in our institution is saying, look, if you see a nodule on an axial CT that shows it's five millimeters and has grown to six millimeters, we look at it as a one millimeter growth, but volumetrically through in three dimensions, the AI capability is not only able to identify it, but also show us changes in size that we don't typically see just in a an axial cut. So what we've been really been able to harness over the last couple of years as these AI programs come out is not only to identify these nodules faster, the AI programs will also send out letters and notifications to patients uh, and physicians, but also they're able to look at them in a way we just never looked at them before, meaning that we are trained to look at dimensions and diameters and change in terms of axial cuts and sagittal cuts and coronal cuts. This is able to take those all together, volumetrically measure them, and honestly identify them as being higher risk or lower risk based on their rate of change. Now, I will tell you, AI is great, but all AIs depend on a human capability and backup. So in terms of identifying, it's great, but really we try and identify navigators or other physicians who are able to look at this data and utilize it. The challenge and the, the, the worry we typically have is that when you rely only on AI for identification of lung nodules, both incidental and lung cancer screening, there's always false positive and false negative, and it never always falls into the same algorithm. So as a result, when we complement AI with a human touch of someone who's focused only on these nodules, that's when you have the most appropriate and most capable uh, program to identify these and not you know, honestly scare patients that an AI uh, model has identified them as impossible lung cancer, calling or sending them information right away. And then the patient says, oh, well, what's going on? And then they come to the clinic and you find out that they have a history of a lung nodule at a different hospital that hasn't changed. So I think that for a first time filter of identifying patients, AI is great, but it really does require patients um, uh, to be interact with the physician as well to, to kind of, um, how do I say, uh, investigate and, um, and discuss that data as opposed to just identifying a nodule itself. Yeah, what Dr. Bobby is saying is definitely A is going to help in identifying the uh, nodules at an earlier stage, but it, uh, it needs a human touch and it's a monitoring from the human end. So to uh, run the structured program, Yep. and uh, to identify which nodule to biopsy, which nodule not to biopsy. That's yep. what... Uh, and, um, and I think what, what we saw with our, you know, keyword search initially, just using the, the electronic medical record, we ended up seeing at first about a 15% false, uh, false hit rate, meaning that the, um, for example, the technology identified the word nodule in the, uh, the radiology report 
But when we went back through it initially, it would say thyroid nodule or it would say adrenal nodule because it caught those parts of the lung. So we would have to filter and enhance that search every week, every month, till it came down to the point we had a 1% false, um, false hit rate because the, the program had gotten so good and we'd been so specific in what we were looking for. Really, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, uh, what's your take uh, in lung cancer screening in never smokers? So, we, you know, I will tell you this. I just had my lung cancer screening clinic two days ago on Thursday, and the, six, uh, the seven patients we had come through, only three of them actually qualified for lung cancer screening. The other ones were either non-smokers who had a family history of, smoke, of lung cancer in non-smoking family members, um, or they were, uh, had other uh, risk factors such as asbestos exposure, radon exposure, but they didn't qualify. So I think that what we have to do is understand that lung cancer screening is based on specific uh, phenotype of individuals and high-risk question, patients, no question. But really, we have to have another avenue for identifying patients who are at risk, but in all honesty, don't follow the high-risk criteria. The challenge with us in the United States is that they're not, they're, those CT scans are not covered by our Medicare services or most private uh, insurers unless they fall in that criteria. And patients end up having to pay out of pocket. Many of these patients can't pay six, $800 for a CT scan that might be life-saving for them. So that's why we've tried to say, look, as a cancer center at Innova, we have decreased the cost of these CT scans down to about $200. But still, we say, is there another way? And this is how we use incidental lung nodules complementary to say you might not qualify for a lung cancer screening, but when you went through the ER with a CT scan, it did show a nodule. And we should not only follow that nodule just in case, but we can also biopsy that early. So I think it's essential to be done in, in, um, in non-smokers, but I think we also have to look at what patients want for their own risk and peace of mind. And also we have to identify and do more research on these at-risk populations typically looked at based on uh, back, cultural background and country of origin, because that is really what we need to find out that we haven't focused on South Asians. We haven't focused on Middle Eastern patients or East Asians in terms of in the United States or in India, what else increases their risk of a cancer that isn't smoking? And we've identified, we know that it's 20% of all lung cancers. We just have to put in strong research to know who we find and who we get CT scans on so we don't increase the false positive rate at the same time. Thank you. Which is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. We are happy to announce, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, we have close to around 1,000 logins from across India. So that's oh, wow. very good thing. And uh, is there any uh, biomarkers that you rely on detection of this high risk nodules, Dr. Bobby? Yeah. So there, this is a, 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 a very interesting and growing um, field of interventional pulmonology right now. When we see these nodules, we can't only go by history or uh, appearance because those, there's no perfect test with regards to those. Really what we're starting to rely on are genetic profiling um, of these patients based on their, either their lung epithelium or their nasal epithelium. So there are a number of companies that are looking at patients at high risk nodules or no nodules at all, where we bring our patients in, call it Percepta test, where we swab the nose, um, looking for the cells in the airway, um, which we include the nose, for a specific gene profile uh, that increases their risk of cancer. Now, there was a New England Journal article in 2010 looking at this that was very specific with regards to the gene profile associated with these patients. So when we see a lung nodule that has a low risk clinically, but we do get a swab that shows off that presence of that specific gene profile, we either will move forward with a biopsy earlier or we'll just be more aggressive in surveillance as well. So it's not necessarily this individual gene itself. For example, we may have EGFR mutations in patients, but they don't actually have lung cancer. Or they never develop lung cancer. What we focus on is more the profiling with multiple genes, a gene array used either through blood or through nasal passages that might increase their risk. With the, same, uh, the same kind of technology is used for patients after they're diagnosed with lung cancer in terms of sending those molecular tests from the blood or the, um, the lung epithelium, not only to wait for the tissue-based molecular tests and immunochemistries to come back, but also we can sometimes see disease, um, 
free-flowing tumor DNA within the blood, we, we can identify as EGFR mutations or up to a thousand other mutations based on just blood testing, as opposed to just the panel used for uh, tissue testing. So what we call it as a liquid biopsy, right? Correct. Correct. So here, I would like to, uh, if you take, uh, before uh, we say bye-bye to you, yeah. so uh, there is a uh, colleague of mine who shared yeah. a CT scan who wants to have your opinion. Can I sure, uh, sure. present that CT? One second. Um, so here is a four millimeter nodule uh -huh. in one of our colleagues. So who is one second? Yeah. No who is otherwise, um, uh, cough, chronic cough for evaluation, probably uh, asthma as is one of the co comorbids. He is also yeah. having some degree of uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease for the past many years. This is the nodule, what you can see here. Yeah. There is no lymphonopathy here. The maximum diameter when we measured, this was 3.8 millimeter. This is the sure. question from the audience. So yeah. Your opinion? And smoking history? No, no. So typically, you know, and this is where, you know, I, I always say this, and I, it, it's sometimes it sounds bad, but it, it's it's the truth. Guidelines are for people who never do this, who don't do this on a regular basis. Specialists who do this all the time don't always follow guidelines because they they have experience. So in this case, someone who is a non-smoker um, who has a lung nodule at three millimeters, but there is a family history of adenosine. Exactly. It, you would typically say from the guidelines, if you look yeah. at the Fleischner criteria on this, there would be no family, there would be no further follow up. Yeah. The challenge is you actually need to look at further than the guidelines. And really in this situation, based on a three millimeter nodule, the history of uh, background in terms of, I assume, South Asian and family history of lung cancer. I think that appropriate follow up for this would be a six to nine month CT scan. OK, okay. typically what we look at is. Overall, a lung cancer, if it is cancer, will double in size over about 300 to 310 days. So if we're able to get a high-resolution CT scan in six to nine months without significant change, I think it's fine. You would continue to follow it for another a year later and finish the whole two-year follow-up versus for because it's a solid nodule. But I would also say that any growth there because of where it's located is something that would say, look, I'm not even going to keep getting CTs. If I see a growth of that, typically even an aspiration risk, you would say either to look for a wedge biopsy to get a piece of that sample for, through VATS as opposed to trying to biopsy it because the pretest probability is high enough with growth that some process is going on and the risk of biopsy and getting a false negative is high in this situation because of the size. Even if you double in size to eight millimeters, depending on what your modality is, either comb beam CT, which we use a lot, that's one of the few ways on that size nodule you can reliably get it. So if you see any growth with that after six to nine months, as opposed to continue to follow it, I would enlist one of the surgeons to do a VAT biopsy to take a wedge of that area and ensure that it's taken care of appropriately. Again, this falls outside the guidelines, but again, guidelines are for people who don't do this all the time. Right. So yeah. we have many more questions to ask you, but in the interest of time, yeah. okay, um, as it is scheduled, so... Thank you so much for joining no, us. I, despite I appreciate it. It really has been an honor. I, 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 uh, I think that these kind of collaborations are really how we not only move the needle in terms of early diagnosis, but look to spread everything that we've learned in different countries um, through to our colleagues around the world. So looking forward for many more sessions along with CCA. Thank you. Very much so. Over to Murli. Thank, thank you, you Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir, Amit Mahajan, sir, and wishing you a great evening ahead. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, you too. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar, sir, for posting those questions. And uh, let me move to the second session of the day. And uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome Dr. T. Raja, sir. Uh, Dr. T. Raja, sir, a very renowned clinician, 
an academician in the field of medical oncology. Sir is currently the director of medical oncology, Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. Sir is also the head of the DNB medical oncology program at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai and an adjunct professor. Sir is a distinguished clinical tutor in the field of medical oncology and has more than 25 years experience in the field of medical oncology and bone marrow transplants. Sir has been part of several international clinical trials and has presented his research work in several national and international platforms and has several peer-reviewed publications in international journals to his credit. Sir, it's a pleasure and honor to have you with us, sir. Over to you. Thank you so much for this kind invitation to AstraZeneca and also to the Chess Council of India. So it was a, it's a great opportunity and it was great to listen to one of the pioneers of incidental pulmonary nodule clinic. Um, so my topic today is, uh, I hope you are able to hear me and uh, you're able to see my slides. Is that okay? Yes, sir. slides are visible and you're audible. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I have been you know, uh, requested the topic is on um, what changed in the last decade, uh, target, particularly focusing on targeted therapies and immunotherapies in lung cancer. Um, as we just heard from uh, you know, uh, Dr. Mahajan, it's a huge problem all over. Also in India, lung cancer is the second most common cancer in, in men and fourth common cancer in women and uh, per annum, 70 to 80,000 of uh, uh, new diagnoses happens in lung cancer in India. And we, we all know that the, the management of lung cancer has moved a lot over the past couple of decades when we were diagnosing lung cancer as uh, simply non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. Then we moved on to qualify the non-small cell lung cancer into squamous, non-squamous, large cell, adeno, so on and so forth. And then in this decade, particularly to moving on to classify them, by molecular uh, pathology as uh, having a uh, driver mutation, for example, EGFR, alc -ROS. And then we now have some additional tools, uh, additional biomarkers, PDL one expression, um, and uh, TMB, to tumor bur mutation burden, TMB, to, to qualify these lung cancers. So these has helped to change the management from earlier day surgery, chemotherapy, radiation as the mainstay. Now then we have moved on to have targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and then combination of various therapies. That is what has happened. I'm just, you know, beginning with the epidermal growth factor receptor EGFR, which was first understood um, way back uh, 20 years ago. This is in 2001 when it was first understood that EGFR mutations can be a driver for uh, lung cancers. And uh, there was a drug called JD1839 at that time was not named that was put on phase one trial uh, for patients with advanced lung cancer. And this is a CT scan of a 45-year-old male treatment, pre-treatment, post-treatment, and you can see a very, very impressive response uh, um, in uh, with the JD1639. Uh, and this is one of those early patients in that uh, phase one and two trial on what we now call as Jefitinib or IRESA. And this lady in 2001 was very sick, and uh, uh, you can see that she's in the wheelchair and she is holding her, you know, um, young grandchild and and then she was one of the candidates for this uh, trial in for with EGFR blockers and uh, in two years what you see in two thousand three that she has dramatically recovered and you also see the grandchild has grown up and this is the birthday of uh, the grandchild and a happy setting and uh, with that we all uh, you know really woke up to the possibility of treating these patients with uh, targeted therapy. And uh, this is one of our earlier patients uh, with targeted therapy. This patient was seen in 2001, uh, lung cancer, and was treated conventionally with chemotherapy. And you see the 2002 picture where there is an initial response. And in 2003, early, she has a progression. And you can see the progression here. And that's the time the EGFR blockers were published. And so we applied for a compassionate use for this particular patient. And we could we were fortunate to get the drug, and you can see that uh, um, from this picture uh, in in uh, February 2003, you see that uh, in October 2003, there is a very good impressive response. So this really convinced us that uh, in Indian population, uh, whatever is, is in the Western data would work. And this is a very typical rash with the EGFR blockers that you see. This is another patient in 2007. He is a busy executive, a 51-year-old male, and he was first diagnosed in October 2007 
with the lung cancer adenocarcinoma and this is how he landed to us in january 2008 extensive bilateral lung nodules and he was on the verge of the ventilator and this is you know january 2008 pictures you know very very aggressive and extensive uh, lung disease and this patient was once again found to have an egfr mutation and therefore this patient was put on uh, what we call erlotinib which is the first generation oral tki for as an egfr inhibitor and he also remarkably turned around and from the verge of ventilator he became better got discharged and he and he started to travel all over the world again and these are the serial ct scan this is 6 months down the line 2008 ct and this is 2009 ct and this man went on to live for about 4 to 5 years with this kind of an extensive lung disease this is with the first generation egfr tkis and we also in our hospital established the the next generation sequencing for detection of these egfr mutation and this is one of our patient sample you will see that uh, um he has a very typical what we call as l858r egfr mutation which is one of the common uh, egfr mutation in the exon 21 and uh, this is a pathogenic mutation and then things moved on what we spoke about is the first generation uh, egfr blockers like erlotinib and gefitinib and then soon the science progressed and then we had second generation and third generation egfr inhibitors and then we learned that in patients who uh, who are on first generation egfr inhibitors like erlotinib if they progress they may respond to a third generation uh, egfr inhibitors like osimertinib this is a patient who was on the first generation egfr tki and you can see that the patient later on progresses and this is the 2017 picture where there is a progression in the in the lung disease and also in the multiple bone disease and this patient was put on the third generation osimertinib tki as a second line option and you can see that uh, there is a very good response and you will see the 2018 april picture that there is a very good uh, you know objective partial response with the osimertinib once we learned that these drugs are so effective and the tolerance is good then uh, we started to move these drugs into the first line and uh, you know the the one of the most iconic trial is known as the flara trial in which the third generation egfr tk osimertinib was offered as a first line Uh, for patients with the non-small cell lung cancer with egfr mutation this was published in 2018 and this is one of our patient in 2018 you can see that uh, this patient has got multiple um, you know liver secondaries and has got lung disease and you can see that this patient was put on first line um, osimertinib and you can see a very impressive response in the follow up ct scan both in the liver and also in the lung and look at the response in the bones this is the july 2018 and this is the september 2018 just in 3 months you could see a very very impressive objective radiological response and also a clinical improvement well being everything that's the that's one of the key messages of these uh, targeted therapies that they are not only good in efficacy but they are also very good in tolerance and the quality of life is also dramatically improved and uh, then we started to learn that uh, as we started to understand that uh, there is something called first generation um, inhibitors and then third generation inhibitors then we also started to understand that the tumor also moves forward it's not a static target and it can also evolve itself and it can also it can also become smarter and smarter and that's what we started to learn uh, to illustrate that is one of our patient um he was diagnosed earlier in 2017 18 and he has this lung cancer pleural effusion you can see and this patient was treated with uh, conventional chemotherapy because at that point he did not show any of these driver mutations in the uh, next generation sequencing and you can see that uh, with uh, conventional chemotherapy there is a very good response the patient was doing well for some time in 2018 but in 2019 you can see that already he is showing uh, you know progression in the disease and at that time to understand this progression we would re biopsy this patient and uh, send for tissue ngs and what we got was this patient has a rare mutation rare egfr mutation in exon 20 that's known as uh, a763 exon 20 insertion and that's the insertion we saw in the follow up uh, you know ngs and uh, that's the uh, exon 20 uh, insertion this is considered as a rare egfr mutation and just then there were publications around uh, this 
and we saw that the second generation TKs were specifically working well with these rare mutations in the exon 20. So therefore, we offered this patient the second generation TKI, and you can see that, uh, I mean, you know, this patient was put on second generation TKI somewhere in May 2019, and you can see that immediately he's showing a very good response with second generation TK. But the tumor doesn't stop there. And this is, uh, you know, in from 2019 to 2020, you see that there is further progression of the disease, both in the brain and also in the lung. And then at this point in time, it was difficult to get a tissue biopsy once again. So at this time, we had to go for a liquid biopsy. And uh, liquid biopsy showed something very interesting. This patient not only continued to have the rare exon 20 insertion in the liquid biopsy, but then has developed an escape mechanism, a new mutation in the EGFR domain known as a T790 mutation. And, and we know that the third generation osimertinib TKIs works well in this T790M and this patient was put on osimertinib and he once again showed response to osimertinib and he went on for another one year. And that tells us that uh, the tumor uh, mutations are not a static target, they are moving targets. That's what we understood in this decade. And there is uh, appearance of uh, resistance and then evolution of secondary changes in this genetic uh, profile. And therefore, we need to continue to monitor them both molecularly and clinically. But now we understand that uh, you know, um, it is not only EGFR, there are many, many mutations. Um, at least uh, more than 50% of patients with advanced non squamous lung cancer are found to have actionable driver mutations. It could be a KRAS, it could be an ALK, it could be a MET, RAF, and so on and so forth. So now, more than 50% of the patients definitely have a molecular target. And uh, FDA has currently approved more than seven to eight. Uh, uh, therapies for these alterations, even though we know that there are more than 20 to 30 alterations, but work is going on and all of them still do not have effective therapies, but seven to eight alterations have already been, these are the common alterations for which there are very, very effective therapies. So therefore in 2022, if we look at how we profile these patients with advanced non-sponsored lung cancer, we see that they can have any of these mutations, more than 50% of the EGFR, ALK, ROS, and BRAF, so on and so forth. Fortunately, there is very, very good effective targetable therapy for many of these mutations. And we'll just quickly run through some of them. We saw the EGFR mutations, but then we learned that EGFR mutations themselves are more heterogeneous. These are these includes common and uncommon mutations. The mutations in the, in the exon 19 and exon 21 are called as common ones, but in exon 20, they are uncommon ones. I have just put some of the uncommon ones here. And then we also learned that uh, these drugs can be effective, not only in the advanced disease setting, but these drugs can be effective in early disease setting. This is the early disease, EGFR mutated lung cancer, adjuvant uh, therapy post-operative. And you can see a very, very good disease-free survival advantage. And this is one of the iconic trials where the hazard ratio is 0 0.20. So therefore, the risk of progression is averted by 80% by putting these patients in post-op osteomeritinib. And now there are more and more drugs for different, different mutations. I'm not going to elaborate on each one of them, but to, just to give you a taste of what is there, this is amivantamab and omoboserotinib for exon 20 insertions, having effective uh, you know, responses and also showing survival advantage. These are the KRAS mutation, the second common mutation in lung cancer. Now we have sotorosib and adagrasib as uh, for this specifically for the KRAS G12C mutation. And now we have um, effective drugs for the RET mutation known as selpercatinib and the pralcetinib. They are, all, they are all already approved, they are all effective. And we have patients already on selpercatinib and, uh, and we have patients for this, the next inhibitor. CMET is another mutation, CMET inhibitor known as capmetinib. We have patients on capmetinib. And we have patients for NTRC gene fusions, and uh, those drugs are known as entrectinib and the TREC mutations and entrectinib. And we already have patients on entrectinib. So uh, these are all the, the changes that have happened over the past decade in the domain of targeted therapy is really, really moving fast. Something else also happened uh, in, in the domain of lung cancer over the past five, six years. That's the advent of immunotherapy. That has once again completely changed the landscape for treating these patients. Now in 2022, 
the paradigm for treating patients who are who have advanced disease but if we don't detect an actionable mutation which is the 50% of the patient the other 50% of the patient we have to compulsorily do their pd l1 expression which is a biomarker and then we qualify them as pdl1 high or or medium or less than 1% and then now we plan therapy uh, based on such information for example you know one patient way back in 2016 this patient is diagnosed as advanced lung cancer and this patient was treated with conventional chemotherapy in our setting and you could see that there is a response to conventional chemotherapy and but then the patient progresses and you you can see the progression in the lung and also in the liver and this patient in 2017 this is one of the first patient on nivolumab uh, which is a, which is an immunotherapy agent first patient of nivo, nivolumab in the country and uh, this is the response that he shows look at the response for in the liver lesions very good response and uh, you can see the response in the lung also and then uh, you know then again just like any other drug and medication when it is working well in the second line or third line setting effectively they are moved into the first line setting this is an important publication known what we call it as keynote 024 and this is where the first line immunotherapy drug pembrolizumab was is offered on the clinical trial very good very good overall survival data this is our patient um who was diagnosed in the year 2018 and this patient uh, this is the time we also established the daco platform in our hospital for detection of the pdl1 biomarker and you can see that this patient has got a biomarker tps score of 95% which is very very high above 50% and you can see the response to pembrolizumab as a single agent and this is in 3 months we can see such a very good response both in the lung and also in the metastatic site in the bones and everywhere and you can see very very impressive response and quality of life improvement then we learned that these immune checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy drugs can be combined with chemotherapy and then that's how now it is popularly used in patients who have a pdl1 of uh, you know more than 1% but less than 50% so i'm again illustrating how these therapeutics have changed the landscape and we, we now dare to treat elderly patients also so i'll tell you the story of an elderly man this is a 99 year old patient who was first diagnosed in 2017 and then this patient uh, progressed in 2018 after observation because at that point in age 99 uh, we didn't want to put him on chemotherapy but then Uh, this drug 2018 atezolizumab got published and this is very good data on elderly patient this is an immunotherapeutic agent and you can see that we put him on uh, atezolizumab and you can see the response to immunotherapy with atezolizumab you can see the response in the lung and also in the other domains but then something else happened in this patient uh, in 2020 he progressed so around those time we started to understand that uh, um there is something called combination immunotherapies doublets and we can use a doublet to rescue a patient who is on a single immunotherapy so we did a doublet on this particular patient and you can see that he at age 103 you can see that we could put him on immunotherapy with a doublet and you can see the pleural effusion has disappeared on on you can see the ct scan and these lung masses have responded and you can see the response very very impressive response and this patient went on to live for another 2 years um, and uh, that's what happened to the patient so as as i mentioned from advanced stage we move these agents into an earlier stage this is a stage 3 patient consolidation and this is a very important trial known as pacific trial where consolidation post chemo radiation in stage 3 patient and this patient had a chemo radiation and you can see that when this, when we put this patient on on consolidation with uh, Uh, with uh, uh, durvalumab immunotherapy and this is in 2020 and you can see that the patient continues to show response continues to show response this is in 2020 this is in 2000 late 2020 and so on and so forth the patient is still doing very well with uh, more than two and a half to three years crossed with a stage 3 lung cancer post ct <coughs> and this patient um, you know this is another example of a different subset of patient small cell lung cancer and you can see that there is a very impressive response with immune checkpoint inhibitors in the small cell lung cancer these are the pre treatment and post treatment images and this is another elderly patient he happens to be a doctor 
and these are the images of uh, uh, him small cell lung cancer you see the response to atezolizumab with small cell lung cancer whether all these agents have have done something completely different and this is the this is the data that is published in 2021 in lancet um they have not only changed the responses they have not only changed just the progression free survival or or disease free survival they have really changed the overall survival you can see the earlier you know historical survival rates of 8 to 12 months earlier just about two two decade ago but now you see that the targeted therapy these patients can now cross 3 years 4 years and with immune checkpoint inhibitors they have already started to cross 2 years 3 years survival so how does the pulmonologist help us here of course i mean we heard an excellent lecture on incidental diagnosis so on and so forth of pulmonary nodule and taking it forward basically uh, an appropriate uh, integrated diagnosis early diagnosis and then you know participating in the mdt and currently in india only 20% or actually 17% of them get diagnosed in early stages but that can be improved by the collaboration of the pulmonologist and cardiothoracic surgeon and the oncology team if all that is done this is the this is the key takeaway uh, from what i want to present uh, the landscape has completely changed in the last decade huge potential to improve survival in these patients particularly with the molecular alterations targeted therapy and immunotherapy has completely changed the management of lung cancer so with that i sincerely thank the chess council of india for arranging this accepting my lecture here and for astra zenica for bringing me here thank you so much thank you sir thank you for that very insightful session sir we have learned a lot from your experiences and also your sessions sir thank you very kind of you so let me take this opportunity to also welcome our second panelist for the day uh, dr ravi doshi sir so dr ravi doshi sir is the national general secretary of the chess council of india he is a consultant pulmonologist and the head of the de department of respiratory medicine as saims indore hospital sir it's a pleasure to have you with us and i hand over the session to dr vijay kumar sir to kindly take over the panel it's a it's a wonderful session dr raja sir it was very very informative and in fact <clears throat> it has uh, changed the perspective of uh, all our pulmonologists the way we think and uh, what is the scope of uh, this targeted therapy and then immunotherapy both as well so uh, without wasting much time let me let me run through we have only 20 minutes to left over so what are the practical issues that we do see come across in india so uh, unfortunately dr bobby is not here to discuss the um, few advances that he can add to the uh, detection of um, ipn and then management of ipn here but uh, in presence of our uh, dr t raja and then dr ravi dosi let's take this panel discussion ahead so in terms of detection we know as from the deluge study um low dose ct and then lung nodule programs are complementary and um, implementing lung nodule programs may alleviate emerging disparities in access to early lung lung cancer detection there is no doubt about it and uh, uh, dr uh, raja sir what are the most common circumstances leading to ipn detection and what proportion of your practice has ipn and uh, first this question goes to dr raja sir and then followed by dr ravi and this is you know uh, thank you uh, vijay sir for asking me this question uh, fortunately uh, fortunately i would say with all humility we work in a hospital wherein there is a very very robust uh, pulmonology division and then the cardiac <laughs> division including the lung transplant team so that really helps and then again um, a very very robust radiology also is uh, you know it, it is very fortunate to work among eminent radiologists who, who are very very um, what do you say uh, very attentive and uh, very very um, objective in their radiological diagnosis and uh, 
very precise in their radiological diagnosis all that helps so we are a referral hospital and uh, and uh, we are uh, we are not talking about the uh, at risk population and and the screening here we are talking about ipn incidental uh, detection as was alluded to by dr mahajan um one of the things that has happened over the past two years is many many patients seem to get a ct um during this covid pandemic and and it is not at all uncommon to see um, changes um in the in the in the lung uh, with this uh, in these circumstances and that leads to uh, a, a sudden uh, you know uptick in the number of lung nodules that are reported across um across every every setup every ct scan center and across every hospital other than that as uh, was mentioned by uh, you know uh, dr mahajan when the patient comes in for various other things from anywhere from um injuries to whatever needs uh, they have for for a lung uh, or 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 uh, a follow up whatever that's how they get detected on ipn and he beautifully enumerated the lung nodule and the size and so on and so forth um so i would say that uh, uh, we are not uh, you know running a robust ipn clinic or or anything um, in any of our setup but the acuity of uh, um, of our radiologists i would say it really complements they have that uh, artificial intelligence program they need a, they need they said they need a navigator but i can say that we don't need all that really because we have so many and the moment they see something they immediately call the physician and our setup is slightly different and we all get alerted to the possibility of a nodule there so we are in a slightly different setup but anyway coming to your question i would say probably around 5% of uh, of of um, i mean you know that that's what lung nodules i mean lung pictures 5% of them come as an ipn therein we are involved in our 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 decision contribution actually yeah um thank you sir for that uh, detailed uh, am i audible yeah so uh Dr. Ravi, would you like to add any comments here? No, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate Rajesh sir for a very, a very uh, elaborative lecture, sir. Although he passed through a few slides very fast, but it was so informative. Uh, thank you, sir, for that. And definitely, uh, just one thing which is very uh, uh, striking is, sir, the uh, the range of medicines that you have. So definitely, the amount of tissue would be a big. big factor for that because that much of molecular uh, ma- molecular studies have to be done on the tissues so that you can go ahead with all the new molecules that you have elaborated right and uh, so when we look at the literature um, regarding missed lung cancer and when where and why so the key points which we need to discuss here is approximately 90% of missed lung cancer cases occur on chest x ray by because as you know uh, very much there are a lot of hidden areas retro cardiac areas retro diaphragmatic areas apices behind the clavicles behind the sternum these are the areas where we cannot identify the nodule even if it is uh, a nodule is there it is very hard to identify so is the ct is going to do perform much better although ct is much more sensitive than chest radiography lung cancer still can be missed as an observer error lesion characteristics and technical defects are the main causes of missed lung cancer so how to overcome this kind of thing situations so are we really missing a um, ipn on ct scan this is very less likely and incidental pulmonary nodules detected on ct ct scan images um as published in the jama it more than 95% of detected nodules uh, can be generally picked up with a good radiology support as uh, dr t raja was suggesting are we following uh, following up the nodules detected incidentally on the ct scan this is a very very big question detection itself is a very um, i'm i'm not talking about the corporate sector alone throughout the india when we look at so it is very um, the nodule clinics or nodule incidental nodule detection rate in india is still at a very very primitive phase i must say that 
So, uh, yes, this can be addressed with adequate follow-up to pick up more lung cancer because almost 5% of all IPNs are lung cancer. That's why the awareness regarding nodules and incidental pulmonary nodules should be um, more common in our pulmonology forums, particularly CCA. There are a lot of you know, uh, pulmonologists who are practicing across the India. So they must look for uh, these incidental pulmonary nodules. So unless the, um, we have an inclination to identify these nodules, it is very, very difficult to detect and then follow these nodules further. Yes, we have discussed, can chest X-ray help in detecting IPN? So in the interest of time, because I, I am looking forward to discuss more with uh, Dr. Raja and Dr. Ravi Dosi, I would like to um, um, skip few slides. So as, uh, as this slide says, it is always better. It's not alone artificial intelligence. It's, it's in combination with a good radiologist and good clinician, good pulmonologist. So we can detect more amount of uh, incidental pulmonary nodules. So there are various other things uh, like um, osteopenia, hiatus hernia, hyperinflation, ILDs. So many can be detected as a incidental findings in the um, routine CT scans. So here, my question is, in a low resource setting and from a scalability perspective, which diagnostic modality would be more feasible to uh, Dr. Raja? Nodule detection on chest X-ray in combination with artificial intelligence versus low-dose CT or and, and a nodule detection on low-dose CT along with AI versus CT. So what is your take home, Dr. Raja, sir? Um, uh, Dr. Vijay, we are you just mentioned that we are talking about a low, a low resource setting. Yes. Uh, and then you also talked about scalability. Yep. I think, uh, so let me say, say some basic thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, you know, I uh, am like, um, uh, whenever I order any scan for my patient, whatever be it, I may have ordered an MRI brain or whatever it is, I make it a point that I always see the scan that is not, not, it's always been a habit. If I order an x-ray, if I order a mammogram, I, I just don't read the reports. In fact, I first see the scan and then I see the report. And that has been just a habit. And I also tell all my students that I insist that they see the scan. They see, and, and I'm slightly upset that nowadays the radiology, I mean, in our radiology department, do not give the heart, everything is on the system. And again, there is a bad, I insist that every image should be seen. So you, you see what is meant by IPN is that there is a nodule and our radiologists are very, very good. And, and in some of our coronary angiogram program and all, we are doing 360 and 640 and you know whatever. So definitely those nodules are there. And most of the time I have seen, the radiologists have seen it and they have reported it. And it's our duty as clinician, any branch, they, if you order any radiology, it's, 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 it's always a good thing, lovely thing to look at the radiology and, that's, and then imbibe it yourself. And from then on, how to act on this nodule is where everybody saw the difficulty. And that's what Dr. Mahajan also pointed out. They needed an AI to detect, pick and bring them to the clinic. They needed a navigator to pick them to the, bring them to the clinic. But what I'm saying is we have so many clinicians, that's our strength, people is our strength. So AI has its own fallacies as we know very well. And um, even you know any good machine learning technique or deep learning technique is fallible. And it is actually, if, if you talk to the uh, you know, people who are specializing in AI and machine learning, you will learn that any, anything they, they want to create an algorithm, it's only the human interface, you know, repeated loops that perfects the AI. So in other words, there is nothing like the human, uh, you know, interface at this point. So I'll be very happy to have a chest X-ray and a low dose CT. That's more than enough. And then attentive. I think AI is little far away and our resources are still not good enough. 
and uh, so load of ct ai i mean sorry it's chest x ray look at the x ray look at the ct and then if you get a pet ct that's fine pet ct you will do pet ct for some other reasons but i think a ct scan is a very very good tool yes so as uh, dr raja rightly mentioned so if if it is whatever the image modality that we are using keep an extra eye and then uh, look at this uh, x rays and then ct scans and try to uh, look at the findings particularly to look for with an extra eye you have to look for nodule detection and then uh, with that um, perception probably we can detect these um, incidental pulmonary nodules and then identification is very important and from there how to manage how to diagnose is a different task and uh, dr ravi dosi are you available yes sir yeah uh, what what do you think you know uh, a role of pet ct in um, early lung cancer evaluation do you think we well, like sir told sir usually means in early it is too far off sir because still it is cost prohibitive in our setting sir so in yeah. early lung cancer detection i would feel more of low ld ct is only something which will be able to help us yeah thank you and ah huh, there is definitely a time lag in referral to the specialist india 80% of patients with uh, um, lung cancer consult their gp or primary care practitioner or physician despite having severe persistent respiratory symptoms sometimes unacceptably longer lag of up to 6 months from symptom onset to initiation of treatment in comparison with studies from western countries so some uh, look at the you know uh, the way how a pulmonologist see these nodules and then diagnose when compared with general medicine specialist and general practitioners or respiratory diploma holders is very very important so to increase the awareness of this lung nodules anything any symptom which is not subsiding we must go for um early uh, uh request for request to raise a ct scan and then with a focus of probably we might be dealing with lung cancer so with that focus every clinician should see the ct scans and then should not uh, neglect the initial respiratory symptoms so that we can pick the uh, lung cancer or incidental pulmonary nodules at a very very early stage rather than giving uh, inappropriate therapy like antibiotics or anti tubercular therapy and uh, how do we bridge the gap of early referral from general physician to a pulmonologist dr ravi can you please add Well, sir, uh, the one very beautiful aspect of what I saw in uh, Mahajan sir's presentation was the referral from the ER directly to the uh, lung nodule clinic. I think we need to create more awareness at the general physician level that uh, whenever they uh, go through uh, CAT scans and they find SPNs, then it is better to send it to a specialist for evaluation. and uh, particularly in case of a lung they should refer to a pulmonologist early so that we can take it to a proper uh, conclusion instead of just saying it is benign because most radiology reports will uh, try to you know minimize the rate of these generally somehow we are losing you uh, dr uh, ravi your voice is cracking so let me ask dr raja sir so from your institution could you please elaborate patient journey of one of your early lung cancer patient preferably a stage 1 or stage 2 was the presentation a lung nodule or at a lung mass how was the referral pattern what were the initial investigation how was the diagnosis confirmed what is your experience sir yeah like uh, what dr ravi was trying to tell is that uh, if only we can i mean i think he made a very good point i was listening to that um if only the uh, the mahajan's presentation the trigger happens at the level of er when he was saying that i was just thinking if the trigger could happen at the radiology 
um, you know, uh, at least in setups uh, like comprehensive setups, like uh, whenever they see in in our radiology for if it was referred by a general physician or for uh, surgical purpose or hernias repair, whatever it is, if they have done a scan and that shows something, if the trigger from that point goes to the pulmonology department, I think that can really significantly reduce. Uh, the reach to the pulmonologist. The moment this patient comes to the attention of the pulmonologist, I'm sure um, you know our radiologists are very very good, and our pulmonologists are very very good. The only thing is connect. So the mo if if the moment the radiologist sees something, and if there is an automatic trigger to the pulmonologist, and uh, once it it reaches the pulmonologist, I'm sure our people then you know quickly take it forward. I mean as as you mentioned. There are several patients who were uh, who were who were worked up for uh, um, certain other reasons. It could be an could be an angiogram, could be a scan or X-ray for something else, and uh, or an incidental screening for a health checkup. So that is, as I told you, that's about five to ten percent of um, you know kind of those kind of patients um, is what five percent I would say or ten percent where non-symptomatic patients who are incidentally visited. That's what. And once they are seen and once they are picked up, then in our setup again, um, things are not difficult. You know, immediately pulmonologists, interventional radiologists, everybody is, uh, everybody works. You know, as a loop and the cardiothoracic team, so that should not be difficult. But I'm sure this is not easy. Uh, definitely, with all humility, this is not e easy in a in a smaller hospital or in a general hospital, and of course. Public hospitals think about them. I mean, think about the load and the pressure. So there are no easy answers. But the 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 chess society or the you know uh, the your societies, uh, if only you can keep on sensitizing the the general practitioners and the radiologists. Have sessions with them, and this is a very good session. You can you should invite all the radiologists. You can invite the radiologists. That would be a good idea. You can invite the general physicians in such forum. And uh, you know that will be that will be the way to really sensitize them that uh, you know you can't uh, just uh, keep treating them and you have to reach out to the pulmonologists. So as you rightly said, Dr. Raja. So what happened is well, once in a publication in of NEJM, what they mentioned is any path breaking invention that comes across the globe or anywhere in the globe to reach to the point of care in a village level or a a two tie city kind of thing it takes at least one and a half decade so it's our duty from chest council of india from your know, oncology society of india to keep on sensitize the physicians and public so that the awareness itself sometimes probably in next decade we might see the similar program of ipn many more in in india and obviously india is means a lot of population we can identify a lot of uh, um, early um, nodules early lung cancers so that the cure rates are better and in the interest of time i would um, i i request you to permit to take another 10 minutes so that we can close the session and there are certain risk calculators like Brock model and where the important factors like history of smoking, history of coexistent emphysema or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or some other form of uh, interstitial lung disease, nodule size, nodule characteristic and presence of speculation, age, sex, everything matters in terms of uh, particularly in this Brock model so that we can um, um, calculate the risk of malignancy in the identified nodules. So, so diagnostic features that point towards benign or malignant nodule, yes, uh, Dr. Ravi, in your experience, what do you think? Uh, what are the various characteristics to say whether the given nodule is benign or malignant? Uh, sir, if it is, I am, I am audible, sir. Yes, 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 please. Uh, sir, smooth margin nodule and uh, nodule definitely smaller in size. Uh, usually, we uh, we feel that if it is a uniform consistency, a homogeneous attenuation is there in the nodule, 
then we usually feel that it is more of benign right and probably calcification yeah. may suggest of uh, hematomas so popcorn calcification these kind of things particularly any nodule if it is have it uh, has a tag towards the pleura that is more characteristic of malignant nodule so diagnostic features that will be evaluated in case of multi nodular presentation what are the various points that you consider dr ravi in case of uh, multi nodular presentation sir definitely if there is a pattern a symmetrical pattern i would feel it is more of a benign etiology rather than an asymmetrical pattern and uh, the nature of distribution whether it is multi lobar uni lobar or is associated with any other uh, findings like reticularity then i would say it is more of benign otherwise uh, uh, very the size is one very important factor in case of uh, multi nodular presentation sir if they are larger nodules then definitely and they are more uh, i would say uh, more near the blood vessels more vasculocentric then we would consider them that they could be some metastatic hematogenic metastatic etiology uh, otherwise uh, multi nodularity sir very rarely we we feel it matlab we feel it to be more of a benign etiology yeah thank you thank you dr ravi so various other risk prediction models we have our bayesian inter, uh, inference malignancy calculator solitary pulmonary nodule malignancy risk as per uh, mayo clinic model plco m2012 risk prediction tool so do you utilize a risk prediction model does a lung nodule have a high risk of malignancy or potential in case superimposed on background of particular comorbidity such as copd or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or other other interstitial lung disease dr ravi what do you think uh yes sir def definitely means uh, if there is an underlying smoking related lung disorder like copd and you have a lung nodule then definitely you tend to uh, think more in favor of a malignant etiology you would you evaluate it a bit more but if you are dealing with a disease which is very much unrelated to any malignant predisposition you tend to think of it less i would put it at that way sir thank you so coming to management aspects we have uh, fleshner society 2017 guidelines which uh, dr mahajan uh, has elaborated in detail so we have asked uh, we have got the information from dr mahajan regarding which guideline he prefers that is fleshner uh, society guidelines he prefers um, in picking up management of how to manage this ipn nodules and is there any is there a management dilemma in case nodules if they vary between size between 8 mm to 30 mm and uh, in presence of indeterminate nodules dr raja and dr ravi both please your comments dr raja sir um I, I, definitely if you if you talk to the radiologists uh, most of the time uh, they have a i mean it's one thing to talk about the ipn criteria like uh, the 6 mm and 8 mm but if you talk to the radiologists most of them they have that uh, ballpark cut off sub centimeter i mean for them anything that is above a centimeter in a good radiology unit and they are really alert i mean alert alert to the sense they are more alive to the possibility of i mean um, getting a diagnostic attempt there the, i mean on a practical note i'm saying but uh, you you heard the uh, ravi would probably will be able to tell better uh, you know um, uh, 8 mm will be a real dilemma but then a serial follow up see the time is also an important metric uh, and if you look at what they have done they have just followed it up uh, they have criteria to follow 6 months or if it's above 8 mm 3 months so that's a very practical intuitive uh, you know that's what most of us do you wouldn't uh, if it is easily accessible anything above 1 cm uh, most of our interventional radiologists are very capable of acquiring a tissue and then if uh, that's not possible our cardiothoracic team wax and everything is there but even for the cardiothoracic if it is sub centimeter 8 mm i'm sure they're going to wait and uh, using time uh, follow up that's that's the that's the most important deal 
whatever dr ravi mentioned i completely agree looking at the uh, you know if it is less number uh, and uh, looking at the structure and a uh, follow again i think it is being alert and uh, following it up would give the perspective dr ravi anything you would like to add mostly sir has covered that aspect sir very small uh, diagnostic dilemma because you can't biopsy them so more to uh, follow them up with time and uh, by that i think around 30 mm to anyway we would be going in for trying a biopsy at least in them sir and uh, a diagnostic dilemma uh, dilemma definitely is there that is why i think all of us are pan world sitting and discussing this whole situation yes sir. yeah probably uh, uh, there is limited access of uh, uh, navigation bronchoscopies in india there is uh, um, yet to uh, archimedes is available across the globe but we don't have a, a btpna that is a bronchoscopic transpulmonary nodule access these are the various modalities that they help in diagnosing such small nodules at a early stage um by bronchoscopic tunneling technique so there is a, definitely the technological side as well uh, india has to has its own limitations at this moment so what is management strategy post ipn detection in real world and uh, what are the frequency of patient that follow up after ipn is detected dr ravi do we have any low, idea woefully low woefully low means right. uh, usually that very comforting report from the radiologists that a benign ripping nodule mostly of benign etiology and they will never come back to you only sir forget the biopsy yep <laughs> <laughs> so what are the various challenges that you experienced during the follow up journey so uh, did you try to manage counsel them when you uh, identify and then tell them so this is likely uh, uh, to turn up into a malignancy we never know please follow up what what are, what kind of modalities that you uh, talk to the patient sir basically we would be offering them a follow up ct scan after a fixed interval maybe 3 months 6 months and looking at the high risk behavior if it is a smoking individual or smoking a person with a significant family history then maybe we would advise him to go in for a biopsy i think uh, if he turns up for the second ct scan at a appropriate time then it is easier we can understand that this patient is concerned family is concerned but i think hardly that would be 10% of all such patients not many of them usually just don't come yeah as dr bobby was mentioning in the follow up ct scan the three dimensional evaluation is more important than the two dimensional evaluation to assess the volume rather than the area of the lesion dr rajesh sir do do you want to add anything here no i agree um it is it's a lot of uh, um all i can add is a good interactive discussion with the radiologist and you know preferably uh, you know in person and then both of you looking at the putting the finger on the nodule talking putting them on the on the block right. and asking them what do you think what do you think and uh, those are the ways to really um not miss out but what uh, what dr ravi said is um challenge how to how to sensitize these patient follow them up see there are two subset of or at least many heterogeneous but we can broadly say two subset some people are hyper um hyper aware or hyper anxious uh, i'm not able to find the best word so they are self initiated they are going to eat uh, our brain and they are not going to leave you and but there are some people or that's probably unfortunately that's the majority um they may not take it uh, or they are preoccupied and uh, you know the various things happen in the real life and so they get lost that is really possible um i don't know how to solve that issue maybe a good interactive as you said already uh, constant sensitization general practitioner and then even reaching out to the public about the whole uh, the single um, point on which we should all harp is early detection yep. because if only we can detect them at um, you know stage 1 and stage 2 we are talking about uh, 80% plus or 90% plus by the survival if, if i if i reach stage 3 then it reaches down to you know 50% already and the stage 3 see already 40% stage 4 so you are down below 10% so 
I think that particular so, message. Yeah, well, this, this information has to reach to every individual, I think, in India. So coming to screening, so we know um, a screening assay, you no know, spearhead in the early detection of lung cancer. So when you start screening, the largest nodule diameter as per the published literature, greater than four row MDCT, so which can cause reduced lung cancer mortality uh, by 20%. So this is very, very important. And if the nodule, nodular volume is greater than 16 uh, in 64 row MDCT, probably the reduced lung cancer, uh, cancer mortality can be as high as 24%. So this is what we need to stress when we talk to our colleagues and the GPs, physicians from now onwards, so that to increase the awareness of early detection of lung cancer in our day-to-day -day practice. So various barriers to screening for lung cancer, patient perspective, provider perspective, and uh, we have uh, already uh, discussed about the technical aspects as well in detection of base lung cancer, lack of artificial intelligence, of course, that may be a very least modality, but again, so whenever there is a human bias is there in, um, in detecting these incidental pulmonary nodules, sometimes A can also help in picking up the nodules at an early stage. And uh, physicians, they do play an important role in early lung cancer detection, especially in patients who have got respiratory symptoms which are not responding to the conventional therapy. And we must keep a very close eye on chronic smokers in patients, what the scan which I have detected, uh, which I, I have presented earlier. So where father has got adenocea history and then son, one of my colleagues, this doctor, has got a four millimeter nodule. So these are the cases that we should um, keep our close follow -up. Despite the nodule is 4 mm, probably as Dr. Bobby rightly said, repeat a CT scan probably in six to nine months. I would probably, we have lesser um, experience in managing these nodules. Probably I would uh, suggest to repeat a CAT scan in three months down the lane to make sure that the nodule is progressing volumetrically. And Lung nodule, this is a um, lung nodule management practice patterns, a survey of Indian physicians as published in Lung India. So where out of 165 uh, respondents answered that they saw up to five patients a month with incidental nodules. That is a huge number. We have close to 3,000 pulmonologists, 4,000 pulmonologists across in India, 4,000 pulmonologists into five nodules per means probably close to 20,000 nodules we can identify on an average, at least if you take 50% of it, we can get 10,000 nodules. So for scrutiny, majority of respondents reported using uh, either chest or a fleshness society guidelines for nodule management, a total of 70 respondents replaced a multidisciplinary approach that is a pulmonologist and uh, any two specialists from radiology, medical oncology or surgery. Whenever there is a dilemma, diagnostic dilemma or decision related dilemma, so it's always better to discuss our colleagues, oncology colleagues or radiology colleagues to take a decision whether this patient has to be subjected to um, biopsy or to monitor and, and as a future course of action. So the, how to strengthen the collaboration of oncorespiratory team in a multidisciplinary team setting. Sir, can I have your um, points, uh, view on this, sir? Dr. Raja, sir? It's very important, very important, particularly when we talk about lung cancer to be multidisciplinary. Uh, I have a very simple advice that uh, um, it should be a multidisciplinary um, consult, but you know, sitting together in a single place, all of them, that's the classical definition of uh, MDT meeting. That's not really necessary. You don't really need to do And then 
where everyone is 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 busy and the time resource but a very simple idea of making sure that if it is a lung i will i will you know involve the cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, let's say one of the uh, medical oncology a surgeon and uh, involve a pulmonologist and similarly if i take a, if i take a if i take a rectum i involve the gastroenterologist and something like that so that mdt culture multidisciplinary consult culture the talking to each other quickly you know threshold to reach out to each other should be a very very low and um, each hospital can find their own way um, but very interactive uh, you know low threshold across the across the various specialty discussion is the only way to solve this issue in our country because in a typical mdt in the in, let us say in us or in, in any of the major center good place yep. per per day per mdt they will discuss 10 case 15 cases that's all for the whole the, for, for the whole unit whole system and throughout the week they will have two to three such clinics that's all but look at the flow that we have yep. i say that every patient make sure that's a very quick cross consult here and they talk to each other and that's the best way to be the word is multidisciplinary consult definitely excellent excellent suggestion sir it is practically may not be possible to sit all the four clinicians together and then discuss these cases but as soon as you identify refer to the concerned pul- pul- person pulmonologist or medical pulmonologist from medical oncologist or surgical oncologist they start discussing pick up your phone and then tell them they, here is a interesting nodule which i think probably this is a very early lung cancer um how to evaluate further so such kind of discussions more interactions um should become the norm yes of course in corporates it is happening i wish um uh, this happens in every uh, government hospital as well sooner than uh, later and yes unlocking the pandora's box in in an ipn so during the covid time we all have seen lot of uh, incidental pulmonary nodules which happen to be ma- majority of times secondary infections like aspergillosis or uh, uh, mucormycosis which we have detected as well uh, in very early stage and then managed uh, accordingly we also come across came across a um, lot of nodules which turn to be uh, uh, a lung cancer um in very early stage so whenever we have an opportunity please look for an opportunity to identify detect the uh, incidental pulmonary nodule at the very early stage that's what is the take home and uh, <clears throat> patients with warning signs and symptoms of lung cancer who have misdiagnosed as tuberculosis this point time and again we have uh, discussed um in in this uh, webinar so it is very very important gone are those days where so whatever the opacities are visible on the chest x ray or ct scan do not assume as a infectious etiology make sure you identify the etiology by uh, subjecting the uh, patient to appropriate biopsy modality or bronchial or lavas or radially bus guided lung biopsy or cryo lung biopsy so that we arrive at the diagnosis before uh, um assuming that this has a infection or tuberculosis that is a very very important point please remember do not assume every opacity that is visible as a uh, tuberculo- uh, is resulting from tuberculosis so we have uh, discussed this biomarker based detection of high risk nodules yes um dr bobby has given his insights look at this taiwan based study the talent study type taiwan lung cancer screening for never smoker trial the lung cancer detection rate was 2.6% in talent study as compared to 1.1% in nlst study and 0.9% in nelson study so prevalence of lung cancer in subjects with family history is 3.2% in first degree it is 3.3% in second degree relatives it is 1.6% whereas third degree relatives it is 1.7% so it is not uncommon to identify um the lung cancer 
in persons who are never smokers, particularly in Indian subset. So the number of cancers that we, lung cancers that we are detecting in non-smokers is pretty high. In the past two decades, that is almost gone up by more than twofold. And uh, your um, uh, valuable inputs, Dr. Rajas, are here on this slide. Completely agree. Um, just be alert. And I think what you said is really the detection, being, being aware of, um, as you rightly said, every opacity in the lung is not an infection. Probably that kind of uh, captures everything that you want. So I know uh, we are uh, uh, over time by, we crossed the time limit by more than 20 minutes, but I'm happy that we have covered almost very, very uh, vital points and practical points in Indian scenario. So um, any take home point from, uh, you want to add uh, uh, Dr. Raja, sir, a single liner probably. No, from I think this being the uh, chess, uh, chess Council India, I think the most important point, even for myself, I'm taking home, is the IPN clinic. Or IPN clinic is what they have, but you may call it as IPN awareness and converting those IPNs into some sort of a appropriate diagnosis. I think we should find our own way. I think the best people to do that are the pulmonologists. And I think in every, every corporate hospitals, like now we have asthma clinic and so on among the pulmonology entry. And um, so you should, you should try and put up an IPN uh, clinic or you must sensitize your registrars and uh, DNB candidates or pulmonology candidates to that particular aspect. Thank you, sir. So uh, as a uh, conclusion remarks, so I sincerely thank uh, Dr. Raja, sir, for his valuable contribution towards this wonderful webinar and uh, I thank my dear friend, colleague, Dr. Ravi Dosi for his inputs and, and uh, sincere thanks to Dr. Bobby uh, for his wisdom. He has shared his wonderful wisdom, how his uh, uh, center is evaluating the incidental pulmonary nodules. We at India are taking really baby steps to increase the awareness of lung cancer screening and early detection of lung cancer. It's a, I feel it is a really long way to go. It's time to kickstart the similar programs what Dr. Bobby Mahajan has shared with us and what the wisdom that Dr. Raja has shared with us and uh, to start this incidental pulmonary nodule programs across various institutes in India. Let's educate our GPs, physicians, in and stressing the importance of early lung cancer detection. Let's escalate the monitoring, perform early interventions to enhance early detection of lung cancer. We can enhance definitely, as Dr. Raja was rightly mentioning, we can enhance the cure rate. If you detect this, uh, uh, these nodules as lung cancer in stage one and stage two, the chance of cure rates is beyond 80%. And uh, if at least if we cannot cure in some settings where if it is a stage three by chance, then using targeted therapy and immunotherapy, we can increase the quality of life as per today's evidence-based knowledge. Um, uh, over to Dr. Pradyumna, I sincerely thank uh, Dr. N.H. Krishna, Dr. Ravi Dosi, Dr. Narendra Metuku, and Dr. Atri, and entire team, and including my uh, uh, webinar partners, Astra, and uh, uh, my technical team, uh, Mr. Amit and Vinod and Puneet for uh, their excellent effort in shaping this webinar. And it's a wonderful. And more importantly, there were close to 1,000 logins today so who uh, uh, followed and then there were various questions in the interest of time i could not because we have covered this broadly i thank sincerely thank uh, the delegates for uh, their active participation thank you so much love you good night over to murli uh, thank you dr vijay kumar sir in the interest of time i have very sincerely like to thank dr t raja sir uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, 
enlightening us and also lending a very insightful session to us thank you dr t raja sir uh, it was a pleasure having you with us and i would also like to thank dr vijay kumar sir and ravi doshi sir and the entire team of cci for their valuable time and we look forward to all your uh, presence in our future scientific engagements as well so wish you all a great evening ahead uh, over to t raja sir sir thank you sir thank you bye thank you good night thank you sir thank you very much thank you all uh, wish you all a great, great evening. Evening. thank you sir thank you